So obviously, with Pastor gone, I am here. I'm over the Four Seas Ministry. And when I teach, or when I actually uh, take it on the Four Seas Ministry, we absorbed a curriculum that was phenomenal. And I'm actually going to teach from that curriculum, and I'm, I'm always going to teach from it, just because I want everyone to experience what the children experience. It's not diluted. Uh, we teach from the Bible, book by book, and it allows them to, we're still in the Old Testament, we absorb it, we learn it, we show them in the importance of it and how it points to Jesus, and then we, we move into the New Testament. But I wanted to deliver it so everyone got to see and hear what they hear. There is no difference between what you are being taught in here. Uh, Pastor Ritt is phenomenal at going further into, deta into detail, but what we teach the children allows them to walk away with a little more knowledge. And when we run the, the classrooms, we love the classrooms to lead with uh, the good news first, and then, then fun, right? It's not opposite. We don't, we don't focus on the fun and diminish the word. We expand on the word, and if we lose our track of time in the word and we forget to do a craft or anything, praise the Lord, right? Because that means they're being that fed. So what, what, uh, when I taught last time, GF, I, I taught from um, Judges. It was God uses Gideon to defeat the Midianites. Now, the Israelites at this time were, were in the promised land, which we know as Canaan. But Joshua died, and they abandoned the Lord and ignored his commandments. Now, you would wonder, well, what are those commandments, right? We know, we know they're the law. But God also went before them and said, before you cross over into the promised land, I want you to understand, if you obey, this Sunday, did Pastor Ritt not hit heavily on obedience, right? We still see it here. God says and, and delivers a list of blessings when it comes down to obedience. But when there's obedience and there's blessings, what's the opposite of it? Curses, right? Right? So there's obedience for, there's blessings on obedience and then curses for disobedience. So I'm going to read Deuteronomy chapter 28. I'm going to kind of hit and, and glance through it quickly, but I just wanted to give you the blessings and then the curses. So Chapter 28, now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Twice obey, right? He already led obey, obey. So we get into the blessings. Blessed shall you be in the city. And blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouse. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. Then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and that you shall be, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of the ground. The Lord will open the, the, the Lord will open to you His good treasure. So you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods, lowercase g, right? We know that the capitalized G is our God, where this God is the gods of the, the, the earth, to serve them. So I, I quickly glanced that, but a lot of blessings. And all, it, all he's asking for is pure obedience. And remember, as I mentioned, setting that groundwork, this is before they come into Canaan, right? He's, he's telling them, before you enter, if you follow these rules, this is everything I will give you. But here's the disobedience. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall you be, be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of, your, fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed shall, be, cursed shall you be when you come in, cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and you shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. 
you shall betroth a wife, but another man shall lie with her. The Lord will bring you and the king whom you set over you uh, to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known. You shall carry much seed out to the field, but gather little. The alien who is among you shall rise higher and higher above you, and you shall come down lower and lower. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon and pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God. They shall besiege you at all your gates until your high and fortified walls in which you trust come down. If you do not carefully observe all the words, and remember, I'm jumping through it, words of the law, yeah, words of the law, you can go through it, yeah, you can go through and read all the first, but I'm just trying to give you the idea of here's all the blessings, but here's just a taste of all the curses as well. If you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in the book, that you may fear his glorious name and awesome name, the Lord your God. Then the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods, which neither you nor your fathers have known, wood and stone. And the Lord will take you back to Egypt in ships, by the way of which I said to you, you shall never see it again, and there you shall be offered for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. So those are the blessings, those are the curses. Now, we see when Israel crosses over, God asked them and told them and commanded them, when you come over, I want you to eliminate everyone there, right? Within the Canaanites. He was fearful of, their, of keeping them around because the Canaanites had false gods, right? And he knew that if you kept a little, it could cause, you know, some trouble. A little leaven, right? Yeah. Right, there it is. So in Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, this is where we see God said to do it, they, they didn't do it. So God said, okay, then their gods are going to be a snare to you. Then the angel of the Lord came upon, up from Gilgal to Bochum and, and said, I let you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of, of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear, tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. Okay, so they got the blessings, the cursings. That generation comes over. They, they understand what they should have done. They've created that disobedience. So now we have false gods amongst Israel. Now here's another portion of it. The generation that was delivered this blessings and curses have now passed away. And in Judges chapter 2, verse 7 through 10, I'll read that to you. We're going to see Joshua pass away, and the generation that carried all of that information have now passed away, but never decided to necessarily pass it down to the next generation. Just like we are called to do, my job as a father-husband is to pour into these children so that they continue the good news into their family. And that's, that's what we're here for, right? For the children, and that's why I love doing it. But we're all here to, to continue the good news and to share it and to spread it. Yeah. Judges chapter 2, 7 through 10. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. And all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at Timnath Harris in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gash. When all the generation had gathered to their fathers, that basically means they passed away, right? They joined them in death. Another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. So we now see, okay, these were the blessings, the curses. You're supposed to drive them out and they let a little stay. Joshua now passed away and Israel said, we're going to keep those commands. You can believe, right? Even though you're leaving, you can, you, we're going to stay true to God. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, and it started a cycle. And this cycle is very familiar to all of us, right? Just because it's back then, the cycle that we're going to see here continues today, right? They were living in the flesh. When I wake up every morning, I have to battle the flesh, right? I have that choice to enter into this cycle or get off of it. And unfortunately, Israel continued in this cycle for 300 years. So the cycle started like this. The Israelites sinned against God by disobeying him and worshiping false gods. God would become angry because he's just and he has to punish sin. And he punished them by bringing up enemies against them. 
then the Israelites cried out to be forgiven. God would raise a judge to come out, deliver them, and then the Israelites would enjoy peace and rest. But what's the problem with a cycle? Here we go again, right? Here we go. So we know God was merciful, and he heard the cries of help. So he would raise up these judges to deliver them from their enemies, even when they continued in their sins. We see in Judges chapter 3, the accounts of several judges that God raised up after Joshua's death. They reigned for about 100, they, they were, um, they led the people for about 140 years. Then in Judges chapter 4 and 5, there's another 67 years that went by. And that's where we see Deborah, or how God used Deborah and Barak to bring victory against the Canaanites. Now, the judges that God raised up helped the people and most of the time, the judges were used to deliver them and, and take them into battle, right? To fight their way out. How many judges were in the Bible? And, I, and forgive me, I'm so used to teaching in a classroom, so I spit out questions because I love the engagement. So please don't, don't hesitate. I, I'm so used to it. How many judges does the, does the Bible list? 14. 14 judges, right? So what does that mean? If a judge is the response of God sending them to pull them out of their sin, how many, do you, do you see 14 judges? It should have been one, but we're seeing 14, which means this cycle was just continually going and going. And when these judges were raised, they obviously had doubts and fears, right? You had Moses, and you can go through multiple people in the Bible that, you know, when God called them, it was like, no, 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 not me. I, I'm not the one to be called. But when I looked at this, I also said, well, judges, you know, I knew, you know, they were there, but what about a king? What about who were they serving at this time? Now, we see that God became their king, their ruler, that judge at Mount Sinai. When they delivered the law, they became, they joined into a covenant with God, right? So God was overseeing them, and God was taking care of them, and God loved them so much that he would send those judges to pull them out. And eventually, after the judges, right, God finally gave them what they asked for, and we know what ended up with that. But what I wanted to look at is in Deuteronomy chapter 26, 16 through 19, this is where God says, you're my special people. You are, you, you are the apple of my eye. This is everything, right? It says, this day the Lord your God commands you to observe these statutes and judges. Therefore, you shall be careful to observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. Today you have proclaimed the Lord to be your God, and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his commandments, and his judgments, and that you will obey his voice. Also, to today the Lord has proclaimed to you to be his special people, just as he promised that you should keep all of his commandments, and that he will set you high above all nations which he has made in praise. Sorry. In praise and in honor, and that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, just as he has spoken, right? So, so God was very merciful to his people. In, now we're going to jump into Judges chapter 6. This is where we're going to eventually get into Gideon, the fifth judge that God was bringing up to deliver them. So in Judges, we're officially in Judges chapter 6, verse 1 through 2. What's funny is if I went back to Judges chapter 4, it starts the same way. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. If you turn to chapter 4, it says the same, right? They did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So immediately, step one of the cycle, what happened? What, what did they do? Yeah, they, right? They sinned against the Lord. So here comes the cycle. God has to what next? Because of their sin. He has to judge them. He has to punish them. So who did he send to punish? The right? The Midianites. And the Midianites were herdsmen from the east. And the Bible says that they were so numerous and so powerful that whenever they came into Israel, the Israelites couldn't stay in their own home. That's why you see at the end of the verse there, they had to stay dens in, dens in the mountain caves and strongholds. So Israel, the Israelites could no longer live in peace. Every time they planted crops and it was time for harvest, guess who came down? 
Midianites. They would raid them of their food. They would take all their animals and leave them with nothing. Two steps forward, ten steps back, right? We know that that lasted for seven years. Seven years is how long Israel was impoverished. Every time this would happen, right, year over year, they would hide in the caves, come out, create the harvest, do it again, and they would be impoverished. They would be going, they're, they're hungry at this point, right? So in verse 6, verse 6, it states, So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Finally, right? The Lord has broken them. They've now cried out. So here we go. Here's that cycle. We're going to see on the third step, the Israelites cried out to God to forgive them. And God sent them a prophet to basically tell them, this is why you are being oppressed by the Midianites. You have forgotten the miracles of God and what he has done for you. He's taken you, you out of Egypt. He's delivered you, and you're now in the promised land. But you decide not to obey. You decide to worship false gods of the Amorites. And Pastor Ritt has taught on this before. The gods during that time were Ashtar and uh, Baal, Baal, and he they were the gods of fertility. And in some of the things that Pastor Ritt has taught about, he's mentioned about some of their sacrifices, right? And how ungodly it was. And these are the people of Israel. These are his chosen people worshiping these false gods. They were playing the harlot, right? They didn't want to just be focused on one God. They had multiple gods. So they cried out, what would be the next step? What is God going to do? He's going he's to raise a judge because it's now time to deliver them. In verses 11 through 16, still in chapter 6. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abzerite, while his son Gideon threshed re- wheat in the winepress in order to hide from the Midianites. So this is where we're now being introduced, right, into Gideon. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all of this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our father has told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Whoa, it wasn't anything we did, right? God, how come you did this to us? And how easy is it for us to deflect? That's just our our nature. But the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this mighty weight of yours, this mighty, uh, uh, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, O my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, here we go again. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. So we see the angel of the Lord. I, I kind of veer off just a little bit that When we see the angel of the Lord, we know that's God appearing in human form, right? We see that as a pre-incarnate Jesus. A lot of people see Jesus existed as a baby or when he was born. But we know as Christians and believers that God has always existed. He just decided to take that incarnate baby form when it was time, but he was always there. So when we see in the Old Testament that phrase, an angel of the Lord, we know that reference. So in this case... What was Gideon doing when Jesus came to speak to him? He was what? Yeah, he was hiding wheat, but he was actually threshing wheat, which is a way of taking the grains off the stem, right? The grains that they would grind grind in to, uh, to make bread. Gideon was hiding, and he was hiding in a wine press, and a wine press was deep in the ground, right? The grapes would be put in there. You'd stomp them. Now, when you thresh wheat, I was reading into it, It was more on the outside valley. You would have a nice little breeze, a pile. You know how you normally would grab leaves as a kid and you throw them in the air and the the light dead ones would fly away and the heavier, healthier ones would come down? This is the same thing. You would have a pitchfork, a pile of wheat. You would throw it up, and as it went up, the light chaff would blow away and the substance would fall back down. But he's in a wine press, and that's not possible. So this guy's really working at it. But he's afraid of the Midianites, so he's willing to do that type of work 
in a wine press to keep the enemy at bay. And keep in mind, the Midianites knew for seven years the routine. So here's the wine press. It's not in season, so the Midianites aren't even paying attention to it. So Gideon is somewhat savvy, but he's also afraid. He knows if I hide here, they won't see me. They're going to be looking for this harvest, not me over here. So Gideon was hiding in the wine press. What did the Lord say to Gideon in verse 12? Mighty man of valor, right? And we all know that. that that's courageous. But it's not just, oh, you know, a great courage. It's actually courage, especially in battle. So God is looking at Gideon, and he says, mighty man of valor, right? And he's in the wine press hiding. <laughs> right? It's, it's so obvious there. But in verse 13, here we go. Gideon says, you have forsaken us. You have forgotten us. You have delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Gideon doubted that God was still with Israel. He had not seen, he's, he's looking for miracles and deliverance, but how is that possible when sin is right in their camp? And we'll see that here shortly. God's going to ask Gideon to do something, and you're going to see what he has to take down in the heart of the city. It says, he didn't realize that his deliverance was right there with him. It was always there. But God needed the right time and the right person. In verse 14, God said, the Lord said, go and save Israel. But wait a minute. You're asking me again. Did I not tell you I am the weakest, right? I come from the weakest clan in the tribe of, Ma of Manasseh. And I am the least in my home. So we see Gideon out of his own mouth calling himself a weak man with a weak clan who's, you know, God found hiding in a wine press. He had little, little to offer God. But why did God choose Gideon? Right, yeah, and, and listen, we hear sovereign, right? He's in complete control of everything. So God in his sovereignty chose Gideon. Gideon was not mighty. He wasn't courageous. In fact, these attacks from the Midianites shaken Gideon's trust in God. So in verse 16... What did the Lord say to assure Gideon? Which he tells us. He tells us all the time. But what did he tell, tell Gideon? I will be with you. Yeah, I will be with you, Gideon. We will defeat the Midianites. So even in the cycle that Israel was in, the rebellion, the idolatry, God was gracious to his children, and he heard their cry. He was going to send Gideon to rescue them from the Midianites, just as he has done, just as he has done with the other judges. The Lord promised to go with Gideon and give him the victory. But before God sent Gideon to fight, he wanted to test Gideon's obedience. In Judges chapter 6, verse 25 through 32. Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of, your, of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has. His father was a pagan worshiper, right? So here, here it is, your father's altar. Cut down the wooden image that it's beside and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement. And take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of image which you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too, too much to do it by day, he did it by night. So we're learning the character of Gideon. Right? And when the man of this city arose early in, in the morning, there was the altar of Baal turned, ter, torn down, and the wooded image that was beside it was cut down. And the second bull was being offered on, on the altar which had been built. So they said to one another, Who has done this thing? Right? These are the men coming out. Who has done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. The man of the city said, Joash, bring out your son that he may die. Because he has not torn down the altar of Baal. And because he has cut down. Sorry. Oh, no, that's not good. It completely. Can I have my phone? <laughs> Enemy at work, I tell you. So let's see. Where was I? Gideon? 30. 30. Okay. Thank you very much. Then the man of the city said to Joash, bring out your son that he may die because he has been torn down, torn down the altar of Baal and because he has cut down the wooden image that he was beside it. But Joash, 
the fa- right? This is uh, Gideon's father, said to all who stood out against him, would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by morning. If he is a god, you recognize again the lowercase g, right? Lowercase g. Let him plead for himself because his altar was, has been torn down. Therefore, on that, that day, he called him Jeroboam saying, let Baal, Baal plead against him because he has torn down his altar. We're going to see where they reference that name for Gideon, right? They're basically saying, if Baal, Baal is this god, then let him contest with Gideon, right? If you, you did that, so Gideon, you, go, you know, he's going to deal with you. Uh, don't worry about it, guys. And that's his father stepping to his side. But remember, he just tore down his father's altar that, that, that were built out there. But God wanted to test his heart, test his obedience. And Gideon did because God knew that if he was obedient in those small things, he would be greater in the bigger ones. And they're eventually going to come to see his obedience. So fast forward a little bit. Here come the Midianites. It's time for harvest. They're ready to invade with a huge army. They brought 135,000 men. The Bible said that they spread along a valley like grasshoppers in abundance, and their camels were like sand on the seashore. Now, we know that they were there for the food and all the belongings, but this time they didn't count on the Lord now rising Gideon, and now he's going to be with Israel. So the Lord came upon Gideon. He pulled out his trumpet, blew it to call the men from all their tribes. And the men came from Gideon's tribe of Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun and Napoli, 32,000 men, but they were still outnumbered, right? We look at 135,000, 32, it's close to four to one. So Gideon, in knowing his character, immediately became doubtful. Just like us, we would too. If I was there, I maybe would have grabbed the trumpet and maybe three, four more times. Because if I got 32 the first time, maybe I can get a little bit more. But unfortunately, that was it. So begin, So Gideon started to doubt his calling. And this is where I want to encourage everyone. When this comes down and it asks for teachers and uh, nursery help or you name, you name all the ministries that are out there, your brain, your flesh immediately tells you, um, um, I don't have the ability. Uh, there's no way I can teach those kids. There's no way I can handle this. There's, I don't have the strength. I don't have the ability. We immediately start to doubt our calling. Right. And that's OK. That's why God gave us this to show us that we're not different. We're, we're the same. But God was patient enough and he continues to be with Gideon. And we'll see it that he allowed him to do that. But in it, in his weakness, God was able to encourage him. And in that weakness, God was able to shine through. So I encourage you that when you do see those opportunities, it might not be for you. Maybe you've never done this or done that or volunteered for VBS. But Let that fear be okay. But what was the one thing that made the difference between Israel's obedience or or Israel's curses or blessings? I just gave it away, right? But (laughs) it's obedience, right? But that's very hard. It's very easy to say because your flesh says go this way, but obedience leads you this way, right? So we are constantly battling in that type of scenario. So Gideon is going to ask God, give me a sign. And not just one sign, give me a second sign. But I'm going to back up because when I just read um, 25 through 32, I skipped over verse 21. So in verse 21, you're going to see this is not the first miracle or, or sign that God sent him. Remember, Gideon was talking to the angel of the Lord. So let's see what miracle was done before him. But still, Gideon needs more. The angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread, and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Whoa, I need more, right? I just saw fire come out of a rock, and that's, that's not enough for me. But, guys, I don't blame them, right? This is a big calling. It's okay. It's okay to have those type of feelings, and God is very sovereign, and he's very patient. So we're going to continue to see that, because In verse 36, same chapter, verse 36, he's going to ask God to do something. And when God does it, he says, thanks for that, but can you do it again? But I'm going to change it on you, right? (laughs) So Gideon, uh, so let's see, uh, verse 36 through 40. So Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, 
as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry all on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as, you've, as you have said. And it was so, when he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Don't, do not be angry with me, but please let me speak just one more. Let me test, I pray, just one more with this fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew all on the ground. Right? So he was encouraged. All right, those are the signs I need. I have 32,000 men. I'm ready to go. Wait a minute. Right? God, God doesn't like the number. God's able to see the hearts of men, right? Men and women, but in general, men, because of what's, what's to come. God's looking deep into them, and he, wants, he sees something that he doesn't like, and he's going to do something about it. So 32,000 men sounds okay. We feel like we can do it, but God's going to now decide to reduce the army, right? He's, gonna, he's going to take as much of, the, of our flesh and power out of it so there is no possible way that you can take credit for it. So in Judges chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. And remember, we have Gideon. He just was encouraged to take these 32,000 men. God is going to shake them to the core. Then Jeroboam, remember what I said. This was the name that they gave him because he tore down the altar. Right? This is, that's why it says, this is Gideon. And all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod. So the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Mor in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned. And 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, the, sa the same shall go with you. And whomever I say to you, This one shall not go with you, the same one shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink, and the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped up, I will save and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hand, and he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. Now the, now the camp of Midian was below them in the valley. So we're seeing God looking at the army, and he says, this is still too large, right? So God would get the, glory, the victory. He needed to reduce the army because he knew how powerful our flesh could be. Right? When we take the glory for ourselves. God wanted the credit for the victory. So how did he tell Gideon on how to re reduce that? What did he say? What was the first thing that he offered? He told them to tell the men. Who are what? Afraid. Who's afraid? Right? I would have been part of that 22,000. Right? I'd have been 22,001. Because I would have been part of it. But, uh, you know, I, I, when I was reading this, I did hear in certain, certain, certain commentaries that that fear, that doubt was... Uh, a, a lack of obedience, right? A lack of trust. So God was able to see kind of down, and that's why he wanted to say, if you're fearful, and if you have this, and tremble, then I want you guys to go. So we know 22,000 less 32,000, 10,000, right? And God still looked at it and said, this is still too large for God. He was going to reduce the number of men. The test had to do with how the man drank the water. Those who drank the water and lapped it up like a dog were chosen to go with Gideon, into battle. How many men put their hands to their mouth and lapped it up? 300, right? And that's an important number. We have to understand because we started off with 32,000 and now we're down to 300. What did the Lord tell Gideon about these 300 men? He would give them the victory over the Midianites, right? So he is going to give it to them. 
a small army, the Israelites knew that there was no way that they could possibly take the victory away from the Lord. The victory would ultimately be the Lord's. So God offered yet another sign to Gideon. This one Gideon did not ask for, but I, I, God probably had to see, and he said he probably needed an additional encouragement. Judges chapter 7, 9 through 15. It happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp. Remember, they're, they're below them. For I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pur, Pur, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And afterward, your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with who? Who did he go down with? Okay, but why? What did God say to go down with if you were what? Yeah, yeah. So, so here we go again. Here's Gideon again. He says, if you're afraid, right? Yeah, take someone with you. So what's the next? Okay, so he went down with someone, right? So he's afraid. It says, uh, then he went down with Pur, his servant, to the outpost of the arm, armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore in multitude. And when Gideon had come down, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have had a dream, to my surprise, a loaf of barley, bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it, so that it fell, it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, into his hand. God has delivered Midian and the whole, the whole camp. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and interpretation that he worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel. Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Right? So the Lord allowed him to eavesdrop. This is one eavesdrop that worked, right? worked in his favor. It ended up encouraging him. He ended up going back and saying, Okay, again, let's go do it. So let's continue to verse 22. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches in the, empty, uh, empty torches in the pitchers. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpet on every side of the whole camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and, a hunt, and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted that watch. They blew the trumpet, broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the 300 companies blew the, 300 companies blew the trumpet and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hand and trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried out, the sword of the Lord and to Gideon. Now... And every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. When the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to Beth Acre. This is where it gets a little goofy for me, right? So I'm going to skip that, but you guys can read that portion. <laughs> but we now see that Gideon was encouraged. He had the 300 men. He led them down right to camp he split the 300 men into groups of 100 he gave them perfect tools for war right trumpet <laughs> an empty jar and torch so god just doesn't deliver the 300 he also gives you tools that are not meant for war now he had men of obedience so sure were they confused and maybe wondering well oh, this doesn't make sense but they received the instructions, and they obeyed. The soldiers followed Gideon to the edge of the Midianite camp at night, and they waited for Gideon to blow the trumpet. He blew the trumpet in verse 20, and they shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. We see that the Midianites started to run, right? The screaming. They turned their swords against each other and actually started killing each other. Now, what part did the Lord take? What, what part did he influence? Yeah, their reaction, right? And them turning their swords on each other. He caused the enemy to turn their swords on one another, killing each other, and we see that the rest fled. Now, they fled, and Gideon and the rest of the army pursued them and ultimately defeated the Midianites. So God wanted the glory for himself, and he got it. He was able to diminish the, the, the army from 32,000 men all the way to 300. They had trumpets, they had jars, and they had torches to defeat an army of 135,000. 
This was the miracle that God wanted to deliver that Gideon was asking for. God personally used him to deliver that, that um, opportunity or that miracle. Gideon was afraid to follow God at first, right? We saw them him in the wine press. God came to him and called him to lead. He doubted God, and he asked for multiple signs. But Gideon and his men, when they, had, when they were the army, they were obedient to follow God. Even when the instructions didn't make sense, they followed him. God was faithful to protect them and give them the victory. Gideon recognized the fact that the victory was the Lord's and not his. And he led Israel as a judge for 40 years. Now, in our message... God chose Gideon as a judge to deliver the Israelites. Gideon was threshing wheat, hiding from the Midianites, when God came to him. Gideon was not a mighty man, God, yet God chose Gideon. He encouraged Gideon along the way by providing sign. God chose his army, and he caused the Midianites to turn on each other. We can learn that all through, although people may have weak faith, which we do, right? It just depends. God is always faithful to accomplish his plans. He uses, amen, imperfect people like Gideon. And we can insert ourselves into that. He wanted Gideon to lead the army, and he wanted the victory to belong to himself. God loves using his people to accomplish his purpose, if they are willing to obey. Gideon followed God's instructions and ultimately delivered the 300. Old Testament, when you look at the New Testament... Right? You see another man. And there's multiple men there, but the one that I'm focused on is the Apostle Paul. He dedicated his life to preaching the truth, right? To raising up churches. And Paul used, God used him to write, you know, most of the New Testament. I want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 9 through 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 9 through 10. So I'm going to start for sake of time. For I am the least of the apostles. Who am I not worthy to be called an apostle? Because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Paul was basically saying, I am the least of all. I am completely unworthy. But why was Paul... Why did he label himself as completely unworthy? What about his past made him unworthy? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Killing Christians, arresting them, ripping from their family, completely breaking them in any which way. But yet, we see God called this man, right? God gave Paul something, something that would help him accomplish God's purpose. And that's the grace of God. So God alone, through his grace, accomplishes plans. God has a purpose, and he uses people like Gideon, Paul, and again, insert us, to achieve it. We can feel scared. We can feel unworthy. But God will give you the grace and strength to follow him. He was able, right, in Judges chapter 6 and 7, to change frightened Gideon into a mighty man of valor. He could change angry Paul right, who persecuted the church and hated them to a courageous preacher. The theme that, that I'll end here is all summed up. I, I want everyone to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 through 10. 2 yeah, Corinthians chapter 12, 9 through 10. Okay. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecution, in distress. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So our weakness makes us depend on God. It draws us closer to him. But if I wasn't, if I didn't have the Lord in my heart and I went into the world and I said, hey, I'm weak. When I'm weak, I'm strong. They would look at me, 
right? Like, what's wrong with you? When you're weak, you're weak. When I'm not feeling well, I go to the doctor and I want him to get me 100% so I have my energy and I'm ready to go. God only works in weakness. That's why you see Gideon was a weak individual, but he was weak enough for God to use. In this type of situation, our weakness allows us to p- depend on God. It allows us to draw pride, that, that ability that you know we allow our flesh to take over. That's all worldly. That's all in us. That's why Paul's like, I will boast in my weakness because the more I boast about it, the more I draw closer to God. Right? So I want to make sure that when we leave here, we get to understand that Gideon was just like you and I, afraid, full of doubt. God was merciful. God provided the grace and was able to deliver them. So when we're ever called into opportunities or we're ever fearful or ever doubtful, we know that we can lean on the grace of God. And if we're not there, we need, just need to check our heart and learn that in our weakness, it's okay to be weak because that's the only way that God can really utilize us. And, and I end here, but like I mentioned when I started, this is what the children are being delivered. This is what they get to hear. So this church understands the importance of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the importance of God's word. So that as they grow and as they go through different strides in life, they understand, you know what? When I do have problems, when I do have issues, the grace of God will allow me to get through it. Because I do have to say, when I'm with them, they are amazing. And I love them. And I know the Lord gave them, them, gave me that opportunity to teach them because I pray for them all the time. Because the things that they have to see and the things that they have to live through they're strong, but, but we get to encourage them. God is using all of us here. That's why when I post on Realm, I say, pray for them, show them love, give them strength because the world out there and the things that they have to go through is completely different than when I was and when you were. So for the abilities that we have, God has put you here at this time in front of that person to encourage them, to encourage that child, to you know, encourage that next generation. So please understand, these children are fed, and you guys are fed just as much. But this church is a thriving church because we rely on the word of God, right? So I'll end there, and uh, I'll end in prayer, and right on time. (laughs) Thank you, Lord, just for this opportunity. Thank you for allowing us just to see how you use weak individuals to accomplish major tasks, but you know how selfish we can be. So may we learn today that the grace that you provide, Lord, is our power, is our strength, and that's all we need to do. You, period, Lord. We don't need to add anything. We don't need to need to try to be a better person. We just need to learn to l- rely on your word, be under your authority, and lean on you. So we love you, Lord. May I ask that we are all weakened today, Lord, so that you can be strengthened and that you can shine in this church and you can use individuals just to build us up to be better and stronger for the body and ultimately to carry your word forth. May you protect Pastor Ritt as he travels. May you protect all the pastors in the church, the children, the elder, elders, anyone part of this church, Lord. Look after them, protect them on their way home. We love you. We praise you and thank you in Jesus name. Amen.